Imagine a world where problem, no problem, isn't just a phrase, but a way of life. Today, we're honored to have Devin Waite and Robert Christensen with us, two remarkable individuals whose lives are a testament to the transformative power of human connection and resilience. And there was this one guy who just basically was bullying his way around with no mask on. And he ran at me and came within this far of my nose, screaming at me that he was going to kill me. I started comparing myself to everybody and thinking less of myself. I'm not really sure where that came from. It came. And the same thing, drugs and alcohol, were a release for me. I would turn that around and all of a sudden I, I would think the world of myself. From traumatic challenges in childhood to overcoming addiction and embracing sobriety, their stories are a powerful reminder that we are not defined by our past. Together, they've built a legacy of mentorship, authentic communication, and unconditional love. Let's dive into their extraordinary journey. Welcome to this episode. Uh, we're honored, we're thrilled to have two men that have uh, agreed to join us and to tell their story, their individual life stories and their stories uh, connected, how they've come together. So to my left, we have Robert Christensen. And to my right, we have Devin Waite. Guys, welcome. Thank Happy you for coming. Here. Yeah. Thanks so for being here, man. Be here. I Thank really you. appreciate you um, willing to come forth and share your stories. Um, Robert, Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, in my research, I see that you are a, a leader, uh, of technology and a leader of personal development. Is that correct? Yeah. It's Can an you, interesting combination. Yeah. It's an awesome combination. When you don't usually see too often. Yeah. Yes. So, so I'm really intrigued. Yeah. Um, and can you tell the audience a little bit about you and what you want them to know? Sure. So I've always been a computer person ever since I was 16. I uh, just took the computers very well. I understood them. I understood them at the very, very lowest level, actually, at like what they call firmware and assembly language. And so I just got it, right? So it was like a glove and hand type thing for me. So I've always rotated into technology and was able to explain very complicated things to people in terms that they could get. All right. So that was my superpower is to take complex and put them into easy to consume things that didn't make people feel stupid. And then I learned that that could make you a lot of money mm. if you do it well. Yeah, right? Okay. Right. So, um, not a few other people. Right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And then um, through my own personal um, obstacles and, and challenges that I've had in my life, um, I either had to get better or live a, a life that wasn't really that great. So, wow. so I had to get better, which meant I had to become a student of the inner work inside. And nothing's mm. more complicated than the inner work. All right. So, isn't I, that true? It, it really is. So, I learned how the inner work had to be done. And then um, I started teaching people how to do the inner work um, as part of my, my path and my journey. And then um, it became a big part of my business to coach people as part of their inner work and how to get better in business as leadership. And then eventually, um, after I exited my last company, um, I'm doing it full time, um, had it as a side hustle for 15 years, right? Um, but now, you know, Motor for Life and the, the company that we have right now, that's what we're dedicated to. I love that yeah. um, motive. For life. What is your motive for life? What what's is your, your motive purpose, for life? Right? Yeah, what's your purpose? I love that. Good. That's great. We're going to get back to you. Yeah, thanks. That's so <laughs> fascinating. Devin, uh, tell us about yourself. Tell us, what would you like the audience to know about you and your work? Sure. Who you are. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. yeah. So my name is Devin Waite, and I have been in the behavioral healthcare industry for the majority of my life. Um, had really had three jobs. Uh, one of those was working at, at one center um, for seven and a half years, another center for 10 years. Um, I eventually became an owner operator at that center and did some consulting as a side hustle um, while I was there and, and then exited that organization and started consulting full-time. So um, so I run a behavioral health um, healthcare consulting firm and um, just really love the work. My my personal purpose is to protect the vulnerable and unite communities, and also to inspire humanity. So um, we uh, we get to do that work and and achieve all of those things. And 
I just really, really love what I do and um, don't really know quite much anything else. And um, connect with Robert years ago, and um, he, you know, by proxy of just being around him, did that personal work. And uh, I, I'm a changed person because of it. That's awesome. We're going to get into that. Before we get into that, though, you said a mouthful, man. What did you say about? Your mission is to say it again. That was really powerful. I think that's like really sure. worthy. And Thank you. Yeah. yeah, it's to protect the vulnerable. Protect the vulnerable. Unite. And what can you can you tell sure. me a little bit about that? What yeah. Are you so there? what I'm saying there is, uh, you know, basically it's our work in the behavioral healthcare industry. Yeah. Um, I I myself um, went through behavioral healthcare treatment um, at a young age, and um, I I experienced it in a certain way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, have only really worked that for the last twenty years, and mm -hmm. so um, that's my connection to recovery, to um, the people who are suffering, their families, mm -hmm. and all of that. So the work that we do on the behavioral health consulting side is around compliance, and so we we believe that sound compliance programs ultimately lead to healthy staff, which ultimately lead to healthy clients. And and we get to unite communities and and inspire humanity in that way. Well, by um, by way of full disclosure, um, I happen to be the CEO of a platform that is the recipient of the services that you provide. So uh, I I am connected to you as a client, and I can say that you do great work, and I really Thank appreciate you. you do help protect the vulnerable, and you put us as an operator in a position where we can do better work, and uh, we can be in a position of greater sustainability because we're more compliant and uh, clients get better care as a result. So I appreciate the work that you've done. Thank you. And you know, you both are doing such, you know, worthy things. Like I just have a sense of worthiness sitting in the middle of you guys. Uh, it's really cool. Yeah. Uh, legitimately. Like it's really awesome, man. And, um, you know, Robert, you're, um, I just sense a transformed soul, a, a, a personhood of transformation in mm -hmm. your your um, your quest for understanding and and uh, growth. And I, I saw a picture that you posted on social media recently. I'm going to put this up uh, post production yeah. of before and after. Oh yeah, lovely. And <laughs> I was like, I was like, now if that isn't. Oh, the, some beautiful hair the there, baby. Beautiful yeah. picture of, of yeah. like a visual representation of a transformation. Absolutely. Yeah. So tell me, like, what's your story? What's uh give me the background of how you got to this place of you know work being able to work in this complex reality of technology, which is extremely complex. Mm -hmm. But I think as you have journeyed forward and had have gained greater insight. The complexity of the human yeah. internal mechanism is so much more it's so complex much more. beyond yeah. anything technology ever could be. Right? It's so true. Isn't uh, it? It's, it's just amazing. It boggles my mind. It's an amazing territory. The journey within within is um, so much more complex than people, and it often scares them, and they don't take it. Right. So this is this is. Uh, a curious place to to step into. So my my world was really interesting. Um, uh, I ended up uh, being raised in the desert, in the high desert up by California, on the way up to Mammoth, a place called Ridgecrest. And we originally lived in Low Care, Southern California, but my dad took us up there, and I grew up in the desert, right? So it was uh, hiking um, in the mountains and uh, fishing and and shooting guns in the in the fall, right? So we go hunting, and that's what I grew up with, and. Um, I was pretty sheltered, very sheltered kid, right? Um, it was a challenging uh, childhood. Okay, mm -hmm. lots of uh, um, arguments, and there's uh, just all the things that come along with a challenging childhood. And I never understood what um, that did to me inside as a as like a imprint mm -hmm. my, around my worthiness, my self worth, and the self talk and the negative self talk I had about myself. Yeah. Um, you know, and then I discovered that, um, was there, was there abuse like, uh, beyond, beyond, uh, sort of maybe the negative talk or, you know, the, Oh yeah. The it was a violent house. Violent house. Yeah. 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 So, and, 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 you know, it came in the form of, of, of physical and as well as verbal 
Mm -hmm. um, and just a really challenging space for a young man to grow up. I was sure. the oldest of three. Yeah. Okay. So I was always put in charge. And when you're put in charge, you're responsible by default. Yeah. Whether you want to be or not. Yeah. And so by the age of 13 or 14, I was, Robert, you're in charge of your brother and sister. And if they go screw up, I got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was never really a good thing. Unenviable yeah. position. It is really, yeah. you know, and I, yeah. so I get the oldest child syndrome yeah. thing, you know, but um, I think what really um, set it off was I discovered drugs and alcohol by the time I was 17. I never had anything prior to that. And it, it was a powder keg that was so big. Wow. That all you had to do is just flick a match into it, and it, and it would off. it would just goes off, and so everything came off the wheels, off the car. The wheels flew <laughs> off the back end. All, it looked like <laughs> a, looked like a dumpster fire within about a year, right? You know, oh. and um, I I wrecked my life so badly, so quickly. By the time I was twenty five, that um, I simply didn't believe that I could ever go forward again. I mean, it was just chaotic. You know, I dropped out of college. I was unable to complete it. I got married um, to somebody who was also uh, in that same space. And By the like, age of 25? This but is no, it's the age of 23. At 23. Three, yeah. So 20, 23, it was pretty much most people would have a resume of the things that you're not supposed to do. <laughs> that was me, right? So I was cooked. Man, wow. By, so that was 1985, right? So by the time I switched over to 87 and I got sober in 1987, um, it just... There was no place else to go. You have to understand, there was, I had felt as bad as I've ever felt in my life, and I literally did not have any options, zero options. So you hit the proverbial rock bottom by this age? Okay. Yeah, it was rock bottom. It was beyond beyond what I ever thought I would feel, though. Really? Yeah. Because yeah. you know, I'd hit bottoms in other ways, but not like that. Yeah. And so, so you know, um, I decided to do something about it. It was more like it was decided for me. <laughs> <laughs> like I had a choice in the matter. <laughs> And, but so, you know, and I was in the rock and roll scene at the time, right? Yeah. So I had all this long blonde hair. I had beautiful hair, man. Yeah. I loved it. You know? Yeah. And then, so I'm I gonna share music. that picture. With yeah, you. I know you're gonna share yeah, it with that picture. that picture. But um, gonna see and you know, so it started my journey of of you know, what are you gonna do about yourself, right? Robert, you can't you can't keep doing that. So what are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. And so what are you gonna do is you're gonna have to start going inward and find out why you act the way you act and do what you do. So I became a student of personal development. And Early, I mean, really mid -20s, mid -20s. in my mid twenties, nineteen eighty, eighty seven, eighty eight, eighty nine. Mm -hmm. I started, and you know, I started cleaning up my life. I started, you know, going through the process of figuring out how to, um, you know, clean up all the relationships. Everybody I owed debts to, I cleaned those up, and I just did all what I call the the excavation. Mm -hmm. Right, the backyard was such a trailer park. Right that I just went back there and did all the cleanup work in my personal life. And was there a program you got involved with? Was there, yeah, was yeah, yeah. It was a 12-step program. 12 step program. Yeah, 12-step okay. program. Yeah. And so there was a, a group of people that I hooked in with. They were selling and I was buying. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Okay, right? Yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. right, right. They That's say, hey, awesome. Robert, we got a yeah. thing over here that you can get your help better. And I go, really? And I said, show me, tell me what to do, and I'll go do it. That's awesome. And that's what happened, really right? Nice. So, yeah. yeah. So for 36 plus years now, it's been that way. Um, Congratulations! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so my big mo mo motivation now is to have, is to raise the self worth of every person I meet. You what know, a so. transformation to raise the self worth of every everybody person I, meet. I meet. Yeah, the that's world. Beautiful, right? So that's our mission. I love that man. Good yeah. work. Thank you. So let's talk about you, Devin. <laughs> let's. Uh, we we got into Robert's you know early journey. Sure. So let's do the same thing with you. It's your okay. turn. Like, yeah. What uh, you know? What has? What was your early early journey like? And uh, take us through to the point to where you sort of had that awakening, that sure. you know, that that tr that turnaround. Okay, yeah. So I I grew up on a, a pretty remote uh, ranch. Our closest neighbor was maybe about a half mile away or so. And uh, um, you guys both had like Breaking Bad, uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Middle of the sticks, right? Well, like, <laughs> tell you. His well, sticks were almost as equally as much as my wow. sticks. Yeah, right? sure. Wow. Twenty thousand person town. Wow. No, 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 no. Mine was a four hundred person town. Oh, but you were but, really the booties. Yeah, we were about fifteen minutes away from a, a, about twenty thousand people, which is where we wow. went to school and everybody worked and all wow. that. But. No, it was a 72 acre cattle ranch. Um, I was. Where is this at? It's in uh, Dolores, Colorado. It's in Dolores, the southwest Colorado. corner of okay. Colorado, uh, okay. kind of close to the Four Corners area. Okay. Yeah. So is it's. That's the Western Slope. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah. yeah so, and, and that 
that whole area has a special place in my heart. Mm -hmm. I, you know, return there probably once a year mm -hmm. um, just to go back. But and my family is still out there. So, uh, but I was very close with my grandparents. Both my mother and father were um, were uh, public uh, worked in the public school system. My father was a, a principal, and my mother taught the hearing impaired and and uh, and deaf and all of that. Uh, my, I had one brother, and every summer uh, growing up on the ranch, uh, my grandfather would put us to work. And uh, in my grandfather's retirement, that was his dream was to run a ranch because he had come from a long line of cattle farmers. But he was also an elementary school principal and, and a music teacher. Um, so when he retired from that, he went to just full ranching. So I, I do, the great thing about that is I got a really good work ethic um, growing up. I, I can't remember when I started, but it was probably when we were strong enough to build a fence, we built a fence and driving tractors and, and all that. Everything's valuable, isn't it? Invaluable. Yep, yeah. Yeah. Everything. You got to drive a tractor? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's stuff <laughs> people dream of. Yeah. I know. <laughs> so that was my, my, and I had a wonderful childhood. I really did. I, I had everything I needed lived a, you know, a simple life out on a ranch and all that. Mm. Uh, what happened with me was um, some point, I'm sure it was in my teens, I started comparing myself to everybody mm. and, and thinking less of myself. And I'm not really sure where that came from. It came. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the same thing, drugs and alcohol were a release for me mm. when, when I would, I would turn that around and all of a sudden I, I would Think the world of myself, yeah. and I would go out and do things that I wouldn't <laughs> normally do, and all that. Took all so, that doubt away, huh? Yeah, yeah, it was the the serum, yeah. you know, for me. So, yeah. uh, or I thought it was, anyways. So, I ended up going over to to Phoenix, Arizona, to uh, to to attempt to go to a graphic design school. It was the best thing I could come up with at the time. I was able to get through uh, high school, but I had left my parents' home when I was seventeen years old, and said, so "I'm going to go do my own thing." and uh, so luckily they intervened on me um, when I was um, out in Phoenix and I entered into treatment when I was 19 years old. 19? Uh, mm -hmm. Wow. You, you, both you guys were really young. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So my dumpster fire, you know, <laughs> just, it was about the same, came, came about, you know, very quickly. Wow. That's and, rare. Uh, you mm -hmm. guys have that in common. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I, uh, I ended up out in California um, for aftercare. And just fell in love with California. I always knew I wanted to come to California and think it would be for that. But like, how'd you end um, up in California? Like, was it uh, for uh, what, what discharge happened? planning? It was. Like yeah, I was. Yeah. I was at a place in 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 Tucson, Arizona, and this was back, gosh, in in uh, two thousand, I want to say. And they gave me two pamphlets, and they said, I, I said I wanted to go to school uh, because I I had dropped out of graphic design school to yeah. do treatment. Yeah. One was a collegiate recovery community in Texas. Texas, yeah, I think yeah. involved with Texas Tech or Texas A and M, one of the two. And then the other one was um, on the peninsula in Newport Beach. Hmm. And I looked at the two pamphlets. This one had <laughs> palm trees and an ocean, and this one didn't. And I said, "Let's that's good. In let's go Beach. there." So, and luckily, I had you know family that was supportive of all of that. That uh, set a pathway for you, didn't it? it a did. trajectory, right? Like so, a, yeah. A and course. In, in fact, that drive with my dad from Arizona to California was one of the fondest memories that I had. Wow. We, we had the chance to reconnect and oh, wow. I made some amends, which was, Is you know, right? um, needed at that time. So I I did my my work out here. I, uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't get sobriety right away. Mm. Um, but, but I did at the age of 22, I had to kind of relight that dumpster fire, but thank goodness it didn't. That wasn't too long. Go out yeah, of control. Yeah. Could you have know? been a lot longer. It could yeah. have. Yeah. So, um, and, and five and a half months, um, the, the treatment center I was at, they should have never hired me, but they did. They did. Mm -hmm. wow. And, uh, and then I've worked in, in treatment ever since. Um, so that was March of 2023. Wow. Yeah. So and the, the, just the, the, there was a destiny, you uh -huh. know, in all of this, it's kind of, you think about it, it doesn't blow your mind. Yeah. So I hear, I hear a common theme mm -hmm. in both of you. I want to talk about a little bit is Robert, what have you learned about adversity, man? Because, um, clearly you went through some adversity. I heard things like gasoline explosion, powder keg, dumpster yeah. fires. I'm hearing that up in the air here 
with this conversation on both sides. Mm -hmm. So it leads me to adversity. What, you know, what have you learned about adversity? What's, uh, that it's necessary. Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, you know, I'm a big fan of Marcus Aurelius and his book, uh, his, his collection of things called meditations. It's one of the, um, three or five most important books that are on the planet today, uh, according to leaders, mm -hmm. right? And so the key, one of the key uh, phrases he says is the obstacle is the way. Without the impediment, um, we as human beings lack um, goals and, and motivation to go after something. So we have to have something to push against, right? Yes. Um, and so that's, I think that's characteristics of human uh, mental health is the lack of obstacles creates a mental health problem. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we have to struggle to give us some value, right? And if I don't yeah. feel value, um, I don't, I do unworthy things, right? So obstacles tend to build value in your effort towards them, but I need help and I need mentorship around it when I go through it. So for myself, um, the obstacles were, um, it's <laughs> the obstacles fell into two camps. Yeah, there were the ones that were out of my control, and then there was the ones that I created. Ooh, okay. Yeah. So a lot of self sabotage that mm -hmm. I was unaware of. I called it unconscious self sabotage, mm -hmm. and those un self un self unconscious self sabotage that occurred in my life. Um, whereas that I would I would bury a landmine on something like I would ignore a bill, or I would create an environment such that I would not be able to recover from it. I would cover it over with a metaphor with dirt. Mm. And then three months later, a month later, whatever is, I come by and I step on it. Yeah. All right. It would blow up blow in my up. face. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, um, a Dur parking ticket goes to warrant. You pick yeah. up some, right. There's all sorts of things out there that we could do. And you don't deal with the issue at the time. You don't want to deal with the obstacle at the time. Mm -mm. So you end up stepping on it mm -hmm. and it has a much larger impact in your life. And then you claim victim. <laughs> okay. Like, how did that happen? And blah, blah, like that. So you're a turtle flipped on its back, waiting for somebody to flip you over. Right. So it creates a victim mentality as well. So unless you learn how to embrace an obstacle, yeah. like and embrace an obstacle as a friend, that's right. As something that you need to work through. Yeah. You will always have the victim mentality that life's against me, that things aren't fair, that why can't I catch a break, all this stuff. And unless you can shift your mindset to that, that makes life really so hard. It's so difficult to wake up and face an obstacle yeah. if you think that you have no control over it. Mm. And the only thing that you have control over is your attitude mm -hmm. and your inner, your inner work, right? That's so, the only thing you control, and, and yeah. so without obstacles, I don't learn. I don't, I'm, probably, I'm quite certain this is going to come back around to me a little later time, but obstacles are where the proving ground for all human existence is how we get better. It's how we learn. We, Enlightenment. Have, to have, we yeah. have to have that obstacle to teach us what we need to know. That's right. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And you, Devin, what about, you know, what's your outlook on adversity? Hmm. You know, I, I've watched people go through it all the time. Um, I, I believe that purpose statement that I gave you, protecting the vulnerable. Had I not gone through my adversity and entered into treatment and did that, that probably wouldn't be one of my sole purposes. That's so cool about adversity, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's wrapped into who I am mm -hmm. now. And uh, with that gives me like a, you know, the steering of the ship, you know, so I'm not just out in the ocean, you know, trying to find my way. I have pretty clear destination of of where I want to go in the direction that I want to go. What's wonderful about all of that is um, out of the adversity came a company, you know, or wow. or, a, or a business and a purpose, mm -hmm. you know, and um, you I would have never thought that going into the adversity. Oh, no, right? not at all. It's, inc it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. If you would have asked me 19 years old, yeah, what are you going to do with all this? Yes. I probably would have said, you know, be a professional skateboarder. Or something. Yeah, I remember specifically a moment when you were in the adversity. Oh this, yeah, this you called me. I did. I he's one of my adversity. <laughs> I mean, I would go back and forth on this. Well, yeah. you, guys, you guys are getting right where I wanted to go to. Yeah. So, like adversity. Okay, so we're talking about the force of human connection, the power of human connection. Like, do we go through adversity by ourselves, or do we go through adversity with Some others? Do. Some do go for yeah, it. So yeah, so tell, tell me about that. What do you think? Oh, it's 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 absolutely trying to get through life without with your hands tied behind your back, right? So mm -hmm. if you if you can't, wow. if you don't have somebody to turn to through an adverse problem, adverse uh, challenge here, 
it becomes a really difficult process because you have no one you have no feedback mm. right so you don't know what you don't know you can't see it like devin can tell me things that i didn't know like i just called him last week on something like hey can you advise me on this yes and um i was having an obstacle to deal with and he was able to take me through it but without that feed from somebody i trust to tell me the truth that becomes I'm in I'm in an echo chamber of my own thinking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that echo chamber of my own thinking. Then I'm starting to buy my own BS. Right. Yes. Navel gazing. Right. Yeah, Next thing right. I know, I'm reading my Helen Press clappings. I'm a great guy. <laughs> yeah. Did you see this? And oh, by the way, all those people that are telling me that I'm I'm having problems, they don't know anything. Wrong. That's right. right? But That's if right. you have somebody you trust, what I call a source of truth, mm-hmm. sources of truth that will will risk the relationship to tell you what you need to hear. Yeah. That's wonderful. Also, you mentioned something earlier, Robert, that I mm-hmm. think is. Um, kind of cool. You were buying what people were selling. Yes. And so I think that's part of like- Coachability. This, yeah. So tell me about that. Like what, you know, you needed you needed something. Somebody else had what you needed, right? Yep. What you didn't have. Yep. And talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So the phrase, the phrase I was, uh, they were selling and I was buying is a very, very important concept. And, and for myself is because it, and when I'm in need, if I'm not willing to receive the feedback that someone else is going to give me after I tell them a problem, then I'm not buying, mm. right? It's conditional. Mm-hmm. I'm shopping for an answer, right? Yeah. And we're in the we're issue. We're in the industry where people shop answers. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. You're not telling me what I want to hear. <laughs> Screw you. Next. I'm going over Next. there, right? Yeah. So Devin and myself have had this relationship for quite some time, where um, we've been able to um, give each other what I consider straight feedback. And he's he is somebody who is extremely coachable. So he is buying, you know, what I'm selling, yeah. right? Quote, and then in return, his he's been able to be very transparent with me about, hey, have you considered this or you considered that? And I cherish those relationships because that's where the juice is. That's where advancement happens. Is am I willing to hear what it, people have to tell me? Mm. Okay, wonderful. And it's you find. You find that people will talk that talk, mm-hmm. but when you actually deliver something to them, mm-hmm. nah, yeah. it yeah. becomes a little harder to deal. We with. have to come outside of ourselves, don't we, to do that? We really do. We really do. Yeah, we yeah. really do. It's not easy. It's not easy. So, yeah. with you, adversity by yourself, or was you, you know, uh, clearly, so, um, uh, Robert has been a key, oh, you yeah. know, member participant in helping you walk through adversity. But you know, yeah. what do you think? Is this human connection really critical and key to walking through and growing through adversity. 100%. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tell abs- me so, how absolutely. so? Yeah. Well, so for the example with Robert, I I had known Robert from, you know, there's been different circles we've mm-hmm. been involved with, but the circle <clears throat> that I knew Robert in, I, I just had so much respect for him when he, the way he carried himself, what he talked about, he had every, he was, I was buying what he was selling. He wasn't even selling it. I was just buying it. Yeah. So I had a huge amount of respect for him. And then um, uh, Robert had invited me to a a mastermind um, that that we had, and that I had just hit the jackpot when that happened um, because it was not only Robert but other people that were involved with this that I I learned to trust mastermind and, and learn from people might not know what mastermind con- the concept of sure. mastermind is can you tell the audience what that is what yeah that, that all about? it's a group of people getting together that share their philosophies and information with each, with each other mainly on personal growth mm. and then uh, with business as well too so this particular mastermind had had quite a few people that had all created successful businesses that had done the personal growth or were doing the personal growth and and how that impacted their business, their families. Mm-hmm. Did they charge you for that or are they no. just willing to share? <clears throat> just willing to share. Mm. Yeah, Beautiful. this was a this was a, a private a private <coughs> cohort of of um, men that we had brought together of like-minded people who wanted to raise their self-worth as a driver to achieve business success. And specifically, it was to create legacy wealth. And we did not shy away from that conversation. That was, it was so important to us, I think. And that's why I invited him, because he wanted to create a legacy mm. for his 
your businesses, mm -hmm. right? The things you were working on and stuff. And so I saw, okay, this guy want, will lean in. And, uh, you know, we, I guess we've had about 20 to 25 different people yeah. in and out of that over the last 10 or 12 years or so. Right. And that, that mass mine. Yeah. So that, that was another circle that I had with Robert. So for the example, when I had faced some adversity and this was when I was exiting my last organization, I, I called up Robert and, and I wouldn't have called any, anybody else. And in fact, had I called somebody else, they would have told me to call Robert. Mm -hmm. And um, and Robert gave me exactly what I I didn't necessarily want to hear what yeah. he had to say, but yeah. I I knew he would deliver it to me. And he told me the the truth, the pure, simplified truth. Mm -hmm. I of course have had the opportunity to to return that favor. And I mean it's it's how'd that happen? You're supposed to be the recipient. Yeah, you're right. You're the giver now. Wait a second. That's just the the way it works. It's, but it's the way it works, huh? You yeah. know, it's it's like when, when you're. When, I'll speak for myself. When I was in it, nothing else matters. I mean, time just stops. And um, and in those conversations, and and Robert practices really good listening, active mm -hmm. listening, and it's something that I'm it's I'm always he does working with his on. Eyes, I can see. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So yeah. so he's engaged. I know. He tells me I, I may not want to hear what he has to say, but he has never guided me, you know, in in a wrong direction ever. I I would tell him anything, That's so anything, cool. and it's uh, a gift, huh? I really need that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a gift. Without mm -hmm. that, um, and carrying around the day to day, or you know, trying to get through it on your own, it's just uh, it's it's really no way to live. Yeah, you know, so, you know Devin, what what you reminded me of here was. <clears throat> Um, the more, as people get successful, they feel less that they can trust people to tell the truth to. Because mm. if they tell them the truth, they I think they feel like it, that they're not qualified now to yeah. be in a position of success. They're in their they, worthiness comes down and if they let that out. They lose their, they lose their position. They lose that, their, what their perceived pers That's position right. is. That's right. And that, mm -hmm. and to me, that's when you need that space the most. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, so you're talking back totally. to this whole point of this podcast is, yeah. is the, the human connection that occurs when somebody is already successful. So lonely island of success, right? That's right. Well, yeah. then, and then what happens is, is the psychology kicks in and they start self-sabotaging so they can right. feel more qualified to be with the masses. Mm -hmm. And we call that the red zone in our practice. Mm -hmm. We call that uh, you're up in the red zone in success and you feel isolated, alone, imposter syndrome, anxiety, free floating, you know. Stuff. A lot of people label a lot of different things, but um, I call him and I'll say, "Hey, I'm in the red zone." He'll call me, say, "I'm in the red zone," and like 45 minutes of conversation go away, and we know instantly what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So wonderful. having that 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 conversation is super super important. How did you guys meet? So, uh, well, I met Robert through through twelve program in twelve step. Yep. Okay. And uh, and then. Those rooms are powerful, huh? Oh, I'm telling you. Yeah. I'm telling you. And, yeah. and and I already had a huge amount of respect for him. I took a risk and I said, I remember this. I'd like to start a business with you. And um, Did you know him or did you just like- I, I knew him well enough. Okay. Uh, but but it, to me, that that, that was, that was a bold. risk. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and we did it. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. We, what kind of business did you guys we start? We started a whiteboard pen business. Wow. How cool. Yeah, tell me a, about that. What is it? What no, is whiteboard it? pens stink. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's be clear. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a writing on the wall guy, right? So, yeah. um, nothing, nothing, nothing uh, ensures absolute, um, complete disconnect of a human being if when you show them a PowerPoint presentation, mm -hmm. right? You walk them through that thing, they just go click, 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 shut yeah. down, um, unless it's in a like two or three slides and you're out, right? right. Something like that. Right. Um, so you have to be able to write on walls. Mm -hmm. Okay, writing on walls is, is a, it's forty thousand year old thing. It's how you engage a community of people. Very human. It's very human. They yeah. did it back in the days yeah. of, of you know campfires and stuff like that on yeah. the walls and tell stories. Yeah. So I mastered the art of whiteboarding. Okay, some many many years ago, and it's been my go to facilitation and, and teaching technique. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I got super frustrated because I would always show up to places. Hey, where's your whiteboard? I see these pins with the caps off. Okay, mm -hmm. and they're all dried out, and none of the right colors. Well, there's only one color, this black. Okay, and so I started carrying my own pens. So I made these cases for my own pens, and I went to Devin. Devin comes to me, he goes, hey, I want to start a business with you. And I go, okay. So I didn't answer him for six months. 
You waited. He kept you waiting for six months. Yeah. And, and wow. Re- it's because starting a business with another person is a very um, important decision. And it's as important as getting married. Yeah. It's intimate too. <laughs> right. Right. Because you lose the power of yeah. doing whatever you want to do. That's right. Because now you have a partner. Yeah. That's right. right. Obligation. Have an obligation to communicate. Yeah. Um, and so I said, you know, I got this whiteboard problem here. What do you think? And he goes, yeah, that sounds great, you know, and stuff. So we ended up filing a couple patents. Uh, we got one of them, yeah. you know, and um, we launched a, a company called Palace Pens. And Palace Pens sells a refillable whiteboard pen so you don't have all of these dried out problems. You carry your own case. It has 75% less plastic. Uh, you look at the, the expos right now, people just throw them in the dump and they weigh more than a plastic bottle. Right. And there's over a billion of those pins made every year. They just go straight into the dump. So we said, hey, go after that. Um, and we've learned so much about consumer product lines and stuff like that. Pretty then. audacious, man. Pretty bold. So did yeah. you guys have a personal relationship before you reached out and said, let's start a business together? Or yeah. yeah. It was the beginning of a relationship. Yeah. 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 We knew why, each other. Why did you reach out to Robert on that point? Like, why was the Robert he, attracting you? You know, I he, th- again, the way he carried himself, I, I was looking to invigorate my life mm-hmm. in, in a different way. And uh and so start, you know, nothing more than starting a business that, that in itself was an obstacle and we hit, we hit some challenges, but you know, when you're going through that together with somebody and you, you see the pathway in, in there. So I've just had so much learning. I, I remember a time when, uh, we were in the design phase and we were just stuck. Yeah. And, um, and so we sat down, um, out of all things, we, I think got out a projector, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, even though that's kind of against, but we didn't necessarily know exactly what we were going to do at that time, brought out the projector and we just started moving. And we had actually, I remember in the mastermind, one of our members had brought a board game to the mastermind group and we had played the board game. And the the lesson that we all took from that is in order to succeed, you just have to move. And if you're not moving, you're not succeeding. And yes. so we ultimately sat yes. down, we made each other move, and we probably right. rocketed, you know, three years worth of work in into a year. And all of a sudden we have a product, we're designing it, we're manufacturing it, and we're selling it. Yeah. It's cool. We're cut we're catching we're touching on so many different dynamics and domains here and relationships like personal, professional, and as as people, right? Success is something, purpose, um, motive, mm-hmm. uh, something we're all trying to get more in tune with, aligned with. But I think to get to all that, it's, it's preceded by quite often, well, all the time, failure. <laughs> so, you know, I know like, you know, going after this business opportunity, um, probably hasn't been just a wonderful succession of of successes. I I bet there's been quite a bit of failure along the way as most businesses uh, encounter. So, how do you guys support each other in in failure? Cuz failure is Oof. failure can be like can <laughs> rock people, you know? It can it can really set people back. It can. Uh, I think I think one of the things the big lesson I learned out of this um doing going to business with Devin on this was that consumer products um is not an adjacent business for me, mm-hmm. okay? It's not adjacent to personal development or in technology, it's like that. It is so, it's a tool that I needed to go solve a problem, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I underestimated how much knowledge I needed to know, mm-hmm. okay? I really did, like plastic injections and molds mm-hmm. and all sorts of stuff like that, import, export out of China, you name it, pricing, habitual consumer behavior is, okay. is by far the biggest obstacle. Hard to break. Heartbreak. Heartbreak. Yeah. Heartbreak. Yeah, yeah. You know, you may not like Starbucks, but <laughs> yeah. you keep going back. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. 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 That's, that's right. That's just so true. I mean, so what do you think? I mean, I, I, I yeah. think that those are some of the, to me, those were some of our harder lessons. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The, and, you know, success in the, in the, or, or failure in the eye of the beholder. But we, through that process, we, we've been through a number of challenges. One of the greatest gifts that was given to me is everything Robert just said. Mm-hmm. I've learned, more about stuff that I had no idea yeah. that I would ever learn about yeah. everything that Robert just said. And now on on the marketing side, yeah. trying to market and sell a product is, um, you know, I was on a 
hour long phone call yesterday, wrap, trying to wrap my head around it even more. And, and every time I just get there a little bit more, what that does is it translates into other areas of my life, yeah. really, in the essence of everything, everything, everything. That's true. When I'm learning more and you know, being brave, you know, trying to take on a product That's when wonderful. neither Robert or I were from the product industry, yeah. we're both in the service industry. Yeah. It's it's been it's been a big learning opportunity. So I I just we stay at it because we, I personally continue to get the lessons yeah. with it. That's beautiful. I think the uh, what I'm wanted to share with the audience is that, you know, we we need to give ourselves permission to fail. And in our relationships, we're going to fail. Mm -hmm. In our endeavors, we're going to fail. And you talked about movement, moving, right? Just move, right? A lot of why, why people don't move is they're not giving themselves the permission to fail or they're fearful of failure, right? And I don't think I've, you know, learned much without having to go through failure first. Well, I want so, to add something to that. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So I was in the mastermind and we're talking about this exact same topic, right? Yeah. About permission to fail and that type of thing. And I was not comfortable with the word failure. Mm. I didn't like it. Mm. Still don't like it. Mm. Okay. Why not? Because I don't believe in it. Okay. Tell me. I just believe that, that we have opportunities and what are we going to learn from them? And so I wanted to rewire my brain's default mode to deal with decisions and not have to live in the past around considering it a failure or considering a regret or any of that kind of stuff. You can say, hey, I have a little failure where I tripped and fell, or I can have a big failure where I have massive regret and shame. Yes. Okay? So this whole spectrum of how I judge my past decision. Okay? Yes. All right. And so I wanted to change that. I mm, really did not want cool. to have that context. I wanted to say this. Yeah, say it. I wanted to have 100% decision-making ability that every decision I make is perfect. Mm. And if there's any decision, Afraid. if there's anything that I needed to know, I would have already known it at the time I made the decision. Mm. God will deliver me the information when I need to know it. That's wonderful. And so therefore, every decision I make is perfect. And what it does is if you have it burned into your, your, your default mode of your thinking, you never go back and question if it's a mistake, mm -hmm. ever. So contrary to the way we were brought up to think, though. That's Robert. right, 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 right. So that's so get, different. I mean, the, the habitual, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I think it's more like when I buy into media hype around how I should think. Yes. Okay. Yes. I don't. I don't agree with that. So I ask myself, how do I want to think? Yes. How do I want to behave? How do I want to have like that? And I think I think about Devin all the time because he knows what I'm talking about here. All right, that there is a section and a part of the, the of the work that we do where we teach people to make 100% perfect decisions. 100%. Mm -hmm. The staff here, you, everybody here makes perfect decisions. The only time that they're questioning that is when they bring their own um, thinking to the yes, table. Yes. Yes. And apply some morality to it or some some standard to it yes. or somebody who they have to live up to yes. or some pre-programmed other person's voice that they got when they were a kid about how yeah. you should have been. Yeah. Screw all that. Yeah. And that's not, that's that's very it's very common. We're all we're all dealing with that. That's of, right. That other voice. That other voice and that that the mindset that we were we acquired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wanted to just deliver that here while yeah. we're here. And so one of the things that he and I do all the time is we have this phrase, okay? When you're confronted with what appears to be a challenge or an obstacle or something like that, we ask ourselves, the problem? No problem. No problem. It's no problem. Problem, it, no problem. Problem, no problem. Tell, tell me more about that. Go ahead. Yeah, so it's essentially if nothing is a problem, hmm. they're all opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so it, it does, uh, I, I will get frustrated from time to time when I'm working in a team environment yep. and, er, and, and, and I see the, the desire to just lull in the problem. Yeah. Mm. When if, and it's because of everything Robert just said, the, the expectations people are putting on themselves, whatever that is. If, if we look at, we shift the way that we think about it and shift our context, problem, no problem, then we we keep moving. I love it, man. You guys are awesome. But I'm going to also argue something I'm seeing here, and maybe you already know this, but sort of the adversity, the path that you both have journeyed through have kind of set you up for this mindset too. 
It's there. Yeah. It was yeah. there. You just needed to awaken it. You just needed to realize it, that those things that you went through were sort of equipping you like to have that solutions-based focus, that mindset, right? That open mindset that others don't necessarily get to. And so that's the amazing thing about adversity too. And those experiences that we've come through, they kind of give us this other um, perspective, you know, this other yeah. ability to tap into a deeper place. And it's a, uh, mm -hmm. it's really wonderful. I sense, I sense love here at the table. Like I'm sitting here and I sense love. And um, I, Robert, I follow you on, on, on social, on yeah. LinkedIn. Yeah. And you're always telling me you love me. Yep. And I don't even know you. I know. But I love that you tell me <laughs> you love me. And yeah. uh, so I had to, I have to go there with you. Like, sure. What is, what is love? What are you, what are oh you talking gosh, that's about? That's a deep pool. Like, what are you saying? And, and, you know, like, wow, you're, you're a man and you're, you you know testosterone and and you look like a tough dude and you're telling me you love me and I do I love just, you. Yeah, just really that is really cool. What, yeah, I love Devin. It? I love you, and I yeah. love Devin. I love everybody in here. Yeah. Everybody what is, what is that about? So what's that's about is this. Um. Uh. So, um, I never heard those words when I was growing up. Mm. They were wow. not freely passed around. Um, my father was a uh, the son of a depression era. My grandparents were Depression era, uh, World War II, that type of thing. So a very stoic Danish background, right? So emotions didn't make their way to the surface like that. So, um, you know, the the conversation is around, I love you and I'm proud of you never never really happened. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I remember working with uh, a mentor of mine, his name was Tony, and he's been, he's been long passed away. Um, and I remember coming to him, I said, all I want to hear is the words, I love you from my father. Yes. And um and so having him tell me that I love you was something I was on a mission of. And I remember uh, going to Tony one time and he he looked at me and he goes, "Okay, smart guy," cuz he was tired of me bringing it up. Mm -hmm. All right? And he says, "How far are you willing to go with this?" And I go, "What do you mean?" He goes, "Um when's the last time you told him you loved him?" Wow. And I went, "Oh, I mean, it was like a, this arrow that went so poof. Mm. Again, the truth, right? Yeah, right. The truth. Yeah. And I didn't want to hear it, but he was right. How do I, how can I, leave, how can I expect to hear I love you from somebody if I don't say it first? If I don't make it safe for somebody to say it? Yes. Okay. So it's true. about safety. It's so I true. love you is a, I'd like, like the Seinfeld episode. It's a big matzo ball on the mm -hmm. table, right? Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you got to be able to create a safe environment for someone to reciprocate that to you. Okay, and if you don't teach them how to say I love you, then you can't expect to have them say it back to you. So I went on this mission, all right? And so it started with just hugging my dad, right? So at first my dad was just this handshake, how you doing son, blah, 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 right? And so I started hugging him first off, right? And he was like someone electrocuted him. So I'd give him this hug and he would go <laughs> like this. And then he'd go, I go, and he, he goes, oh, okay, that's good enough. I'm he wander <laughs> off, right? And he just did, oh, rah, 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 rah. And my, my dad uh, would then come and I, then he gave me, he knew I was going to give up. So I gave him another big hug. When I see him again, I bring the family over and we'd say hello and stuff. He'd get to see the grandkids. And he would start giving me, you know, this 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 one is called the man back slap, right? So mm -hmm. that one arm back slap mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Whack, whack, right? Don't, yeah. don't get too close with me, but I'll reciprocate, right? Yeah. And then over time, about six months of me doing this, eight months of me doing this, he finally, I felt, remember, he submitted and he just, allowed for a hug huge it was it was the most huge. important moment in my dad and my life when huge. he embraced me Ugh. i mean it was that just, must have been wonderful it was huge oh huge so, all right that's and so, so great so now and then i told him i loved you and you know what he did what did he do he goes yeah right and he walked off <laughs> <laughs> And I went, oh, okay, we have another mountain to climb here, yeah, right? right? We just got past this one. Yeah. And uh, so it took another five years of me telling him I love him before he said something. It happened when I was driving back from Las Vegas from a conference, just chatting with him and stuff like that. And then, right, I said, say, Dad, I love you. And he goes, I love you too, click. Mm. And I went, what, 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 wait, hang on. Wait, when they pull him wow. back through the phone, right? But I was driving there and I go, oh my God, there it was. Mm. There was the first memory. I don't know if I, he may have said, but I don't remember it. But first memory 
And I remember the scene. I was right near um, uh, past Baker between Barstow, somewhere right there, right? And I remember it. It was the sun was going down. And I remember the scene. And from that day till now, it may have been two or three more times since he sent it, but it doesn't matter anymore. That's right. It doesn't matter anymore yeah. because I was able to teach him that I was a safe place to say I love you. Yeah. I was safe. And from that point on, I make it a point to tell the people who are willing to be around me, to be in my community, to be around me like that, you know, that I love them. And I truly mean it, right? I mean it. So when I post on LinkedIn I and or other place, Instagram, Facebook, whatever, I love you is always how I close the close them. And I mean it. Yeah. I'm so glad that um this podcast is giving you the platform to yeah. share it was the, so the important. meaning behind what love is for you because you're not alone. Yeah. And actually the audience may not be able to see it, but I can see your eyes watering up as you're talking about love well, and your experience my, with love. Yeah. And it's so important. you're you know, there's just so many other people out there that need that, that are looking for that. Yeah. And um so thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you? What, what's, uh, you know, I sense love from yeah. you. You've, you've always been a, just a loving, you know, kind soul. And yeah, um, I think you, you know, in my life, you showed me love when others weren't willing to show me love in, in a way. Uh, We've talked about that before. Sure. Right. Yeah. So why, why is love important to you, my friend? Well, I mean, just to touch back on that, um, that goes back to protecting the vulnerable. Mm. um you know i i I, I love them yeah and so you know i'll go to any links to um to protect those people that that could be harmed in some way whether it's they harm themselves or somebody else or mm. whatnot so um but you know love to me i i i had a wonderful relationship um with my father so um a little bit different than robert but what i will say is that the the love that Robert has for me is um, a, a special love, and you touched on it. Like we're we're men. There's testosterone, and yeah. you know, um, and so to have another man tell another man, even outside of their father, that they love him is um, can be different for the outside little, world. A little uncomfortable right? and peculiar, right? Another circle that um, that Robert and I are involved with is is uh, supporting other men mm. um, because men um, in their lives um, they're they're out there they're fighting for their families their communities their you know the the old age old hunting and gathering is now working yeah and um, you know providing and all of that and uh, you know it can be kind of a a, a cold. Um, thankless you know area sure sometimes for men and so um so for example in the mastermind um i i would bring a lot of that to that group of just the the pain of going out there and and doing it and trying to succeed mm -hmm. for my family mm -hmm. and um you know to be able to sp spill everything and once a year we would throw our 100% financial status up on the wall for everybody in the mastermind to see. Mm -hmm. And we're talking debt and everything. Yeah. And it's literally like standing naked yeah. in front of other, other Very men. Very vulnerable. Yeah, because my yeah. ego tells me uh, not to do that at all. That. No, absolutely not. Yeah. And so to be vulnerable, with anybody, but especially another man is, um, it's, it's an important step. And so we, we support a lot of, uh, other men, everybody, mm -hmm. but, you know, specifically f for that reason, because of the, the fight and the struggle and all that. So, you know, love for me, the, the, be able to show love for another man is, it's like a sacred thing for me because there's sometimes a pain in their eyes that, I may understand that nobody else understands and to let them know that they're okay and we're here for you. And, uh, and you know, the obstacle is the way yes. and all the other things that we say, the problem, the problem, all of that. Um, it, it does, it creates a community, a human connection. And there's a, there's a huge suicide rate out there for, yeah, for, there. for everyone. But yeah. if you wanted to look at men alone and so, um, 
I believe the that work and just saying I love you to another man and being there for him, you know, cuts through all that. Can change a life. Absolutely. Can save a life. Yeah. yeah sure. You guys have been doing, you know, important work in each of your paths and um, you are, you know, you're connected clearly. The question I would have for you, Robert, and your connection with Devin, mm -hmm. you know, what's the maybe the most sig thing of significance uh, or meaning of that moment, that, that, you know, that experience you had with Devin thus far. Thus far? Yeah. <clears throat> the most memorable one is when he um, exited the previous company before he started his own company. All right. And he had been talking to me about wanting to go out on his own and be his own professional services company. And, um, specifically that. And he told me what he wanted to do. And I said, that is the best business plan I've ever heard. Mm. How many times I've told you that? <laughs> 10 times, 20 times? Yeah. That, and, um, and he, um, he started and he would call me, I guess you call me maybe like once a week, easy, <laughs> maybe even twice a week saying, I don't know what I'm doing and <laughs> I'm, I'm out of control. Right? I don't know what I'm doing. I only yeah. got enough money to last this amount of months. I've got a cliff coming up here mm -hmm. and there's nothing like a cliff, a financial cliff to get you busy. That's yeah. right. All right. Yeah. To get you motivated. Yeah. And so I said, just go get one client, go figure it out. Don't worry about 45 or marketing or anything like that. Call on the 10 people, you know, and tell them what you're doing and get mm -hmm. them to agree to pay you three grand a month or four grand a month or something like that. And I have it as a retainer, kind of like a lawyer, yeah. right? And so he would go, he literally, I remember him writing there. He's sitting there looking like then he writes all this stuff down and then he goes and does it and it <laughs> yeah. worked. And then he calls me back. He goes, it worked. And we <laughs> high five each other. And I go, hell yeah, dude, good job. Good job. Good job. <laughs> And he goes, and he goes, okay, what do I do next? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly, it was like a month of this, right? Yeah. And we were like so tight at that moment, right? Yeah. This was mm. um, just after COVID yeah. loosened up. 20, early 2020. Early 2020, yeah, right, 2020, right? Right in that time frame, COVID yeah. was going on, it was like that. And it was such a chaotic business time. You know about yeah, that, right? Yeah, it was exactly. crazy. Yeah, we didn't know and so that. he would call me again and I said, okay, who else are you going to call? And he would list out the people. And I said, okay, what are you going to say to each one of these people? Mm -hmm. And he goes, this is what I'm going to say. And okay, okay. I said, remember, bring an agreement and a pen. Very tactical, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I want you to set it in front of them. Yeah. And tell them the sign. The doing, the completing. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And they go, and what did they do? They did, right? Yeah. 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 And we did that for you about the first five, six clients, right? I, I remember the day Robert told me, he goes, you, you, I was think I complained about how much work because I I had done the work <laughs> that, that he guided me to it. do, and he goes, "You're going to have to hire an employee," and I said, "What do you mean I'm going <laughs> to hire an employee? Like I, I I'll in, maybe an independent contractor can subcontract to me. I'm open to that. A couple hours a week." And he goes, "No, time to hire W two. You're going to provide benefits. You're you're going to yeah, you know do a exact do a payroll." And I, I said, you know, it just, it, it blew my mind, but I'm so glad he told me that. And he said, you're the, you're the chef and you need waiters, right? No, 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 no it's a good around. analogy though. Yeah, I like yeah. that one. Right? No, yeah, no. That's a great one. That's <laughs> it was a different one. What was it? Oh, it, the hunter. Well, no, no. You're the hunter and you need yeah. cooks. That's what it uh, is. Guess, okay, so yeah. so in the yeah. classic sales yeah. environment, right? Bring you need hunters and, and you need cooks, right? Yeah. yeah. And someone's got to dress it. Someone's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You gotta, yeah. Um, so he's a great closer, yeah. right? And yeah. he needed people to come behind him. So he hadn't couldn't didn't need to be the doer like that because it wouldn't scale. That's right. And so I I I still think the business he is in is hands down in the behavioral health industry one of the best business ideas I had heard ever. Mm -hmm. And that is his ability to be a fractional compliance officer. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Which is right up there with paying the electricity. Yes. Okay. It is. <laughs> it absolutely. is, isn't it? Because if you lose your licensing, you're out. Super important. Right? But they don't want to hire somebody full time. Right? You yeah. can't, I mean, you can't yeah. pay 10 yeah. grand a month for somebody yeah. to be right through that. So he sits right in this nice little spot. And um, I just told him to stay focused on that. And he's been doing an excellent job for the last well, three, four years. Well, it's amazing. Me. Yeah. Uh, you know, watching you tell the story, watching you participate in the story, just seeing, we're talking about human connection. That's I right. can literally see the connection. You are as happy as oh, yeah. he is for being part of the journey. It's yeah, amazing. Yeah, You're invested. You said we actually earlier. You said we. That, tell me, that told me a lot. So you've been 
the recipient, even the participant in this we mm -hmm. mental mentality, mindset, the way that Robert approaches relationships, this connection. Well, let's what, let's also be clear here. Yeah. I don't own any of his business. I don't receive any monetary value from it. Oh, that I okay. see that. I, I see that. that. That's but, why I'm. But that's I wanna, why I'm blown away. I want to deliver something here. It's for amazing you. to watch because I, I, I discern that. I, I, well, let me give you the inside scoop here. Yeah. All right. Because there's something that's hugely missing that most people don't get, and that is the more I give, the more I get. Mm. Okay. So this is a this is a currency of love and currency of compassion that has to be fulfilled in our in our world. Right. Um, I believe God is love. Okay. And love Beautiful. is the primary currency by which I trade. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so my success individually depends on how I contribute to another person's life, how I contribute to another person's life. Mm. And so by raising the worth of people around me, his worth and business is worth like that. I know that I will be a recipient of it, but I still got to do the action. I still got to do the work, right? It's just not going to land on me. My point is, is this, is that the reason I'm so excited about it because I know I'm going to get something about it, okay, mm -hmm. as well, right? There's, there's, there's always this reciprocation, you know, this, this True. energy that's going to go around. True. So I know that it doesn't go to waste and know like that. So I understand that piece. The other part, though, that I think is a higher piece in that, is that um, when you sit on the front row of somebody else's successes, mm -hmm. like you're in, you're yeah, in the stands, you're stands right? right? You're right yeah. there on the 50 yard yeah. line, two rows yeah. up, and you're watching somebody on the playing field yeah. and they're doing what you coach them to do. Yes. There is no yeah. other feeling like that. Ah, that's so awesome. Mm. Yeah. There is, I mean, there Great. is, it is the joy of my life. Mm. It's like my kids have all grown up and they stop asking for advice anymore. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> They don't want to know. Dad, I got this. All right. Purpose, okay, so motive. Right. There you go. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. yeah, that's, your, but, that's um, what gets you going. I, I, I tease my kids, come back and ask for Ooh, advice yeah. all the time. But my <laughs> point is this, is that seeing him succeed is is as equally as joyful as anything I could ever do in my life. That's so wonderful. Yeah. And it shows. And so I'd ask you the same question. Mm -hmm. you know, you're on the other side and you've had many, you know, meaningful experiences. Um, What's been like the most impactful, important thing you've gone through with Robert? What's that? What's that thing oh, for you? Boy, um, for me, um, it's there's Robert's. Robert called me. I remember one time. This this is what's coming to mind for me right now, and um, it was outside of a Costco. Do you, yeah. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, <laughs> I won't get into it, but to be- You can. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Wow. Uh, you you had an interaction with somebody yes. and um, and you needed to just debrief that interaction. Yeah. It was during COVID. Mm -hmm. During COVID. It was yeah, crazy it was times. Crazy. There was a lot going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that Robert trusted me with that conversation um, and- you know, it it just it was another mile marker of the, of the man that he is. That he he reaches out to his community, he makes the connection, and he gets right. Mm -hmm. I know? forgot about that, Devin. Mm -hmm. I, that I did that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was such a. So it was on the outside of Costco. It was inside that the the place where people eat, right mm -hmm. <clears throat> here in um in uh, Aliso Viejo, and. Everybody's walking around with masks and everybody's just worried, right? Yeah. I mean, it was crazy times. Uh, it was crazy. The only place that was open was Costco, right? That you can go buy your stuff and you had to leave. Yeah. You didn't want to make eye contact. You didn't want to make eye contact with anybody. Yeah. It, and there was this one guy who just basically was bullying his way around with no mask on, right? Mm. In the whole place. And, and I don't take a politics on either side of that. He yeah. was just really <laughs> a, a, a bad a, a difficult person to be around aggressive Ag real aggressive yeah. he was yelling at the people and they came in and stuff like that yeah. so i called him out on it yeah okay so yeah. that's probably wasn't the smartest thing <laughs> to do because he was not very well, uh, he was very, relatively unhinged yes and he ran at me and came within this far of my nose wow screaming at me oh. that he was going to kill me wow in front of all these people and I just, I, I don't know where this came from, but I just held myself, stood there, and I said, you do what you need to do, but at the end of the day, you'll be in the jail cell and I will not. Mm -hmm. And I just stood there. Mm. 
And I, I, I had a calm on me that I'd never had known before. Mm. I mean, I was just like, okay. And um, so after it was all over, they was broke. They, they separated us. The, <laughs> the security guard was there, separated us. And he left. And I was shaking. And I didn't know anybody to call except for him. And I called him. And I told him what was going on. It took about 10 minutes to kind of just get the energy out of it. Yeah, that was a big deal. It was a huge was a deal. deal. It was a That's huge a deal. deal. And all of this energy and all this masculine like what they call just raw power yeah. that this guy yeah. was coming at me yeah. with. and he was taller than me he yeah. was bigger than me yeah. he, had, he was very muscular mm -hmm. and <clears throat> i just i don't know where that came from inside me to very just threatening to just, but just to stand there just yeah i just didn't know where that came from yeah you know and well. so when i so like you said so let's get to the point here and that i knew he was the first person i thought to call what did you say when he called you? I don't remember. <laughs> really I, I, I think I you, what you and I did was I say, hey, man, this happened. Can mm -hmm. I just talk to you for a little yeah. while? Yeah. Yeah, we just talked. I just, I just need Listening. you to hold space, mm -hmm. all right? Just because, um, you know, I made a mistake and said something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know what that was inside me that went, went up to this guy and just flicked him in the forehead. Mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just felt like picking a fight, you yeah. know? And I'm like, yeah. look at me, man. Yeah. Look at, you know, this guy could have yeah. easily snapped me. Yeah. But I don't, but I don't know what that was about because yeah. it was kind of like one of those, you know, dogs that run around that barks all the time like mm. that, you know? Yeah. And I just, I, you know what it is? What is it? When I, when I was a teenager, I always got beat up by guys there like you that. Go. There you mm -hmm. go. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. In my high school. Yeah. Uh, one of my major two or three trauma, what I call big T trauma things, yeah, right? Right. Was it being attacked in the bathroom when I was a freshman by two two men that were like that, two um like juniors or something like that. Yeah. Right. And they yeah. they literally attacked me in the bathroom. Mm. Right. And I yeah. and then I would get a lot of fights and yeah. uh, I would always get beat up. Yeah. Until I joined the wrestling team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was a wrestler too. Were you a wrestler too? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No one messes with a wrestler yeah. after it they get a lot of those it, problems. It cures, it. instantly <laughs> cures the problems of people. Now. Yeah. yeah, I got moves. Right? Yeah. Hey, you might get me with a punch, but yeah. we're going to get on the ground. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, I think that's what it was. I mean, yeah. there's a, this, this deep that's part, real, like I that's just real. do not want to tolerate a guy like that in my life. Yeah. And so the connection between him and I was, there was so much deep built-in trust between us. Mm -hmm. that he didn't have to question where I was coming from. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I forgot that I called you on that one. Yeah. That's interesting that you brought that up. Yeah. And it's the trust. Yeah. He built so, that. He yeah. Built that. Absolutely. The There's a lot of equity. Yeah. Yeah. Built in. Yeah. In so his relationships. it meant the world to me that he, he trusted me with that moment. Wasn't that cool? Mm -hmm. What did that feel yeah. like? What did it feel like? Oh, it when someone's reaching out to you like amazing. that. Amazing. In that moment. Yeah. Right? And you're usually the guy before that was the reacher outer. Sure. Now yeah, you're being exactly. reached out too. I, that was a pivotal moment. And then, you know, Robert talked about, you know, me and being on the sidelines, but yeah, you know, he, him and the the step he took, you know, leaving the company that oh, yeah. that you were at and going full on into the personal development and coaching. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's a huge step for him. I I know it is. Mm -hmm. And it's just been inspirational moment after inspirational moment watching him along that journey and and you know going going full on with it you know yeah, so it's quite the leap wasn't it it was yeah. yeah you know the 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 essence of human connection um it can't be faked it has to be no. completely authentic and uh you know i just see the authenticity and the connection here between the two of you Reminds me of a, a statement. What was it? Um, the language of the heart cannot be rehearsed. Say that again. The language of the heart cannot be rehearsed. Mm, yeah, so true. Yeah. yeah. So it's, what does that mean to you? It means that if I, if I feel an emotion coming up um, while I'm in a, a public space or conversation like this or mm -hmm. speaking somewhere, yeah. I let it. Yeah. I let it come up and I, and I, and I have try to articulate what it is that I'm, that I'm feeling in a way that people can understand um, that I'm not losing them. But being transparent that way um, is a great connector of people. Right. Yes. Right. Right. So my, my heart language is that I am, have had really difficult physical violence in my life. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, um, that if, if I can go through this, you can too. Yeah. 
right? Right. That that there's a way out of this stuff, you know? And um, the heart language, you cannot be rehearsed, but his meaning is that, is that there's no way he could have known I was going to call him, okay? And there's no way he could have rehearsed anything that was going to be in response to that call. And so he just had to feel enough confidence to just sit there and listen to what I had to say and know, and know that he doesn't have to say anything back. Mm -hmm. that's, that's real power, by the way, is being able to hold space and listen to people transparently, knowing that you, there is no right answer. There's nothing that you need to do. There's no conversation that has to be had. And, mm -hmm. you know, let me summarize this up for you, Robert. No, none of that's just going <laughs> to go on, you know? Yeah. Is personal development leader mm -hmm. in, in that position that you hold? Right. Is there personal development without human connection? That's a great question. I, I, I hesitant, hesitant, hesitate to say that there is, there is no um, human connection and personal development. Is there a part of it? I think that um, it starts with the connection that I have with myself, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that means that there is some identity that I have to say I'm going to get in a relationship with. The point of personal development is so I can have a better relationship with you. Mm -hmm. That's at the end of the day, you know, whether it's in finance, relationships, or health, um, how I engage with you is going to be based on how I develop myself internally, right? And so I think the answer to the question, kind of in a roundabout way, I think that you have to have personal relationship and personal development. There's one, one, one needs the other. Yeah. They're interconnected. They are interconnected. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think the, um, you know, your background, we talked about earlier, like how you both have been prepared for coming to this solution mindset, you know, this bias toward looking, leaning into the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert, your background, the technology and the complexity of technology, and then the, um, you know, the, the, the complexity that that just is way beyond technology of the human condition, like it's it's exponentially more it complex. Mm -hmm. How has that background of technology informed you in turn how you're approaching, you know, the complexity of the human condition? What what have you? you what know, have how has that prepared you to be more effective in dealing with this? Because we're dealing with it all the time, right, Devin, mm -hmm. in behavior health, like. Uh, we're just like, wow, we don't even understand this. We we try to understand this. Science tries to inform us, but there's just so much that we don't understand. Mm. So from a technologist <laughs> standpoint, I'm curious, like, how could you help, I guess, us on this side? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, what is that? What has that helped you? How has that helped you to sort of, you know, under have a better understanding of the complexity of the human condition? Well, we have to make sure you understand technology as a tool. Right. Mm -hmm. So a tool to help human beings do things better. Yeah. Right. That's what technology is. And um, technology uh, runs on um, the, in, the, the merging of a piece of hardware, something physical, like a chip. Yeah. Right. Um, this, this microphone and how it's connected to the other stuff that's in here is all written, uh, driven by electrical current. And that's fine. Um, but then there's some intelligence over the top of it. And that intelligence is uh, what they call software. And that software makes decisions based on something that's going on. And so, all right, so you have an analogy between a brain, a human brain, right? Which is hardware, yep. it's water. So the yep. brain's submerged in that. It's taking up 20% uh, of all the energy of my body. It's only weighs 5% of my body weight though. Mm -hmm. So it's a supercomputer up there, literally. So that's the analogy I take right away. Okay, that I have a supercomputer submit, submitted, uh, submerged in water. Yes. That's having electrical current going between neural synapses that form thought and consciousness. Mm. Right. So if I look at my brain the same way I look at a large scale computer system, I can draw lines of analogies between the two of them all day long. And so um, one of the most important aspects of that for me lately, mm -hmm. the things I've been digging into a lot, yeah. is what's something called the default mode network. Mm -hmm. Default mode network is a psycho psychological uh, framework about 
somebody who just happens to be sitting there in what they call wake, uh, wakeful rest state. They're not doing anything. Kind of look what you're doing right now, mm -hmm. right? And you, Devin's over there been paying attention. If you're listening to this podcast, you might be perfectly in a what they call wakeful rest position. That's your default mode. Yeah. Well, the brain is hugely active during the, de the default mode. They thought that that wasn't the case at all. Mm. They thought it was just kind of going on to like like yeah, powering yeah, down, power, right? Like yeah, a screensaver yeah. came yeah, up, yeah, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> not not no, so much. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. And what happens in that mode is that we we rotate into thinking about ourselves. We rotate into thinking about others and what they're thinking about us. Mm -hmm. And then thinking about the past and thinking about the future. So in the default mode, it all becomes about us and our relationship to other people as a background noise, mm -hmm. right? So if you think about that in computers, computers have a whole bunch of background things that are, it's doing just to keep, a, keep things going. And I think about that the same way. So that's how I relate the technologies together. Now, having had all that experience in technology, how can I apply what I've learned in the technology world to making myself better in, let's say, for example, in the default mode? Mm -hmm. And so we've developed applications, the, uh, the mobile apps that allow us to um, train our brain to be um, more positive in the default mode, Yeah. okay? To have a better, um, different context about happiness and love and caring and stuff while I'm sitting here not doing a thing. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is that because my default mode is so much less noisy and more happy, I'm able to listen to people. Mm. Present. I'm present, right? Yeah. I'm not thinking about the next question that's or why right. am I here or when's this interview going to end or any of that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> None of that's happening. And so when you, when you kick over that level of getting enough reprogramming of your brain in the default mode, you're able to sit quietly for long periods of time and being happy, just contented sitting there, which is, I think, what every single person on this planet wants. Mm. Is yes. to just be okay with be themselves. Okay. Just be to be okay. okay. Yeah. Be okay yeah. with the voices in my head. Be okay with what I'm doing. Having some degree of personal um, inner value that I can, that I feel like I'm, I'm okay, that I'm loved and I'm okay. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was interested to hear your answer to that question and you did not, you did not disappoint. <laughs> uh, we have a, a hot topic in our world right now in general, in society, but it's really even more so hot, hotter uh, in behavioral health care. I was at a conference last week and uh, we were talking about another, one topic and this little topic came out of nowhere and it took over the room. Mm. It's the topic of AI. And so I want to frame the question to both of you first with you, Devin, you know, AI, mm -hmm. what, you know, how can AI be harnessed to help uh, to achieve our mission in behavioral health care, right? Your, mm -hmm. your particular uh, you know, mission is for the vulnerable, right? Right. And so how can we use you know, AI to sure. help achieve that mission in yeah. your world, your thinking, your mindset? Yeah, so, um, and technology just means so much more to me today than it, than it ever has, because we, we speak a, about technology in, in different ways. But with AI specifically in behavioral healthcare, um, and I believe like similar to other industries, the way it, it has a place and where it can help protect the vulnerable, help the clients get better faster, is making the jobs of the people who are doing the behavioral health, the provision of behavioral health care treatment, um, not necessarily easier, yeah. but to lower the bar of the workload that they mm -hmm. carry. For example, clinicians in the world that we live in today, if it's not written in, it didn't happen. That's right. And it has to be written in a certain way for the health insurance companies to accept it and say- you betcha. <laughs> this is good. That's right. Yes. We'll, we'll pay you for your services. That's right. Because if it's not written a certain way, they're not going to accept it. They're nope. not going to pay you for your services. So with AI, there is an opportunity um, for clinicians, doctors, anybody, I believe, direct care services, also on an administrative standpoint, but clinically specifically, to lower the, the, the mountain they have to climb with all that documentation 
so that it, it can summarize it for them and they can review. There's there always has to be a review. We're not going to let technology do the jobs of of people that should be doing the jobs, the clinicians, and um, and make their job easier in a way or make them more powerful so that they can help the clients get better faster. I remember the days when we had to really monitor caseloads mm -hmm. because the amount, the, the mountain, the climb on documentation was so high and you certainly don't want them carrying that into the next day yeah. or burnout forbid taking it yeah. home where they're not yeah. supposed to or any of that. Yeah. So yeah. So that's where I, I see the immediate, place for it and yeah. and i think you know it's only gonna go uphill from there so i hear like the metaphor what i just heard is like um we still need the carpenters but we need a really good hammer in the hands of the car carpenter to swing that yeah to the, swing it the right? tools do, do are the, improving it's a tool it's yeah. not a replacement oh right? absolutely yeah oh thank you for that yeah how about how about on the side of personal development how are you leveraging ai what do you think mm. uh, the place is for ai in that world um I <clears throat> I believe uh, everything what, what Devin just said is absolutely like a game changer. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen in the next two years or something like that. Yeah. Um, they call it large language models to be able to go through, take the interpretation, could take a recording from a, a session, cr crush it down into the right framework, and it automatically pops it in there for them, right? Yeah. Something to that effect. Yeah. Um, on the personal development side, um, we've already started um, attaching an AI companion piece to our app that allows for the client, the person who's running the app, our gift app, to create a personal success statement that matches what they want. It creates it, informs it up, and pops it into their, the, their, their application. And then they, the client can read that every day. And then um, that- Cool. That repeated behavior that's cool is how you change your default mode right yes. so um a lot of times we find the big obstacle for most clients is that they don't know how to write a success statement mm. and we just let the large language model the the chat gpt mm. or the gemini or whatever help kind of, them with that yeah just pop it in and it's super easy that's nice. um and we i see that kind of augmented piece being like the first level stuff yeah um going past that though there is um a lot of work coming out of the federal government on the military side about um, post, uh, like you see it with Navy SEALs who come in what they call being inspected coming in off of a, of a shift or mm -hmm. of a, a, a command, um, a deployment, excuse me. And they, they do an interview with them and they, they, at, they are looking for yeah. problems, yeah. right? They want yeah. to see anything happen out there and, they, and they're, they're not ready for it. Yeah. And it turns out that um, when somebody talks to an AI bot about their psychological disposition, the person tends to be more truthful, mm. which was just the opposite the of what I thought would happen. Yeah, right. Okay. And that is really fascinating. And if you think about it, because the the other you can't offend the other thing. Yeah. Mm. It's safer. It's no safe. It's no judgment. Yeah. It's safer. <laughs> judgment free. Yeah. It's safer from a from just a, a getting stuff out point of view. Yeah. And you see that today when you engage with like a chat GPT, you don't have to be polite to it. <laughs> you don't no type please you say do this and do it now yes it doesn't take offense mm -hmm. <laughs> right so you know you, you've got this greater facilitator facilitator right so yeah. so if i'm somebody who's not so much struggling with mental health not like that i'm just saying hey i don't know what to do mm. and you talk to something mm -hmm. and it comes back with you with saying yeah. hey, here's what you should do mm -hmm. based on what you're going through right now yeah you end up having an opportunity to engage so i see that there's these tiers that are going to go on with AI in this sense, as we get better with our language models, those language models will turn into what I call engagement models. How do I ask it questions and it becomes my companion or my assistant? And then from there, it's going to go into, I don't know, all sorts of different places, but uh, I still think that's about 10 years out, eight years out on that. Thank you for your perspective. You yeah. guys, we've, uh, We've exhausted all of our time. I yeah. don't think we've exhausted all of the conversation. Oh, no, we could have kind of very much more. We could have <laughs> kept going and going. Thank you both for uh, joining me in this conversation of the power and the force of human connection. You've done a wonderful job of modeling that and sharing your experience uh, individually and collectively. Uh, Robert, for the audience out there, uh, where can they find you on the internet and the work that you're doing, which is really 
impactful, important, and effective. I'd say you're doing really great work. So where can the audience find you out there? We're at motiveforlife.com. That's all spelled out, motive for life. And we are a team that provides uh, personal and professional development, um, whether you're an individual uh, doing really specific work for your own self or in your business as a leadership development. Um, and then also you can find me on LinkedIn at Robert Christensen. That's pretty pretty straightforward. There, a pretty broad community there. Um, and we have a, a little little showing over here in Instagram and a pretty sizable uh, community on Facebook as well. So you can reach out to any of those things or Robert at MotiveForLife.com. We'd be happy to respond. Congratulations on the work you're doing. Thank it's you. Wonderful. Devin, yeah. where can the audience find you? Sure. Yeah. Out there on the internet. Sir, thank yeah. you. Yeah, you can find me at uh, our website is Circa Behavioral. It's C I R C A behavioral.com. And um, also on LinkedIn uh, at Devin Waite. Um, we, we have other uh, social handles. If you just look up Circa Behavioral, you find us. And you can always reach me at Devin at Circa Behavioral.com. Wonderful. Thank you, audience, for joining us today. Thank you, gentlemen, for being a thank part you. of this discussion. It was wonderful, enriching, and I'm very grateful. Thank you very much.